Good morning, Faith Arlington Online family. We are so glad you are tuned in this morning. If you are a guest or a visitor wanting to know a little bit more about our church, you can always go to our website, fbachurch.org, or call the church office. We'd love to talk with you and answer any questions you may have going on. In just a few moments, we're gonna be entering into a time of worship, but before that, we wanna make sure we send you ways to stay connected with Faith Arlington. Text the keyword UPDATES to the phone number 43506 to sign up for automatic text updates of all things Faith Arlington. Visit our Faith Arlington Facebook page and our Faith Arlington Instagram account. Check out what's going on with our children and students at our Faith Arlington Children's Ministry Facebook page and for our students, the Vive Facebook page and Vive Instagram account. We pray this service is a blessing to you. Now let's lean in as we begin our worship.
Well, good morning, Faith family, and we want to say happy Memorial Day weekend to you. Hey, I have the incredible privilege and honor today of introducing you to one of my new uh, dear friends. Uh, first, I want to tell you how we met. So about three weeks ago, uh, I was out for a jog and doing my cool down, come around the corner, and I ran into Mr. Young, and he had on a, a World War II hat. And so I thanked him for his services, and about 30 minutes later, uh, we were having church on the corner. <laughs> and so so I, I want to introduce to you, it's my privilege and honor of introducing you to a hero of well, the faith and a hero of our country. So Mr. Jim Young. And Mr. Jim, I just want to say thank you for taking just a few minutes today to, to let us interview you, for lack of a better term. Well. Let you I, share your story. I thank you very much, but I kind of back off from the hero word. <laughs> I think the hero is the one that did not come home. Mm. I had a number of, of relatives that were one killed on Corregidor, one killed on Iwo Jima, and one killed in Germany. Mm. And those that gave their lives, they were the hero. Mm. So, but thank you for the honor anyway. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Book. Thank you. Thank you. My please. name is Jim Young. I'm a life born Memphian. I've lived in Memphis. Of course, I'm living in Arlington now with my daughter. Mm. But uh, I spent 90 nine percent of my life other than when I was in the service in Memphis. I was born on a little shanty boat where the uh, Beale Street goes into the river. They have built a landing place there now but this in 1926 that's the year I was born there were a number of houseboats lined up there but in 1927 uh, you might not be aware of it but one of the big floods took place in 1927. Mm. So it changed the whole look of the front, front there. And my dad, I don't know whether he, uh, I know we moved down to the foot of Illinois Street, but I don't know what happened, you know, what happened to the houseboat. But my earliest recollection is living in a tent across the river on the Arkansas side. Mm. I probably was about five years old. I was uh, inducted into the Army as soon as I turned 18, and I was immediately sent to Georgia for basic training, Chattanooga first and then to Georgia for training. And while I was in Georgia, I was supposed to have gotten six-week basic training, but they cut it short uh, because of what was happening. I went in in, in December, and uh, I was in it for the rest of the course, I was in the rest of the war until the end of it. Mm. As long as the Battle of the Bulls lasted, we uh, we went almost, well, almost across Germany. One of the things that we were uh, issued was a little toy like I had when I was a kid. And it this thing was, they called it, a, we, I called it a beetle because it was painted and shaped just like the little be the beetle toys I had when I was a kid at home. But what, what it was designed for, and it was very ingenious, uh, in the hedgerows, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the hedgerows between, a hedgerow is a, a line of, of, of uh, foliage between the fields, and they had filled up and grown up, and some of them with vines, and so thick you couldn't hardly, you couldn't crawl through it much less walk through it, you couldn't see through it. Some of them be six, eight, 10, 20 feet wide. But they came up with this, I don't know who did, but they came up with this little toy. Can you hear that? <laughs> All right, they issued each one of us. I'm now looking at an eight foot fence or so, and uh, it's there to keep me from seeing the, the neighbor, neighbor from seeing us. But on the other side of that uh, hedgerow, of course, Germans, and uh, if we wanted to know if there was American over there, we clicked that clicker one time, and if it was American, he, he answered it with two clicks. Mm. So that identified the, 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 whoever was on the other side of that. Uh, uh, of course, later on, the Germans, they, their intelligence found out about it. So. <laughs> I was first taught about Jesus by my mama. She was the first one to tell me about Jesus. Even though we lived on a river and we didn't uh, go to church, but every time she had an opportunity, she'd go to church and she had a Bible. 
I had never really prayed in my life before. I had not. Even though my mama had prayed for me, but I had repeated, the, I say I hadn't prayed, I'd say now I lay me down to sleep tomorrow. And a child's prayer. But other than that, I had not prayed. But this young man, the one that was sick in there, he was a Christian. I didn't know it then. But he had a New Testament Bible, and I had a New Testament that my sister-in-law had given me, and it had a metal plate on it. It supposedly would keep the bullet, you know, from hitting your heart, put in your pocket here. I found out years later, it wasn't a shield on the outside, it was a shield on the inside. It didn't take you long to determine <clears throat> by sound if artillery shell was going to come in, fall short, or go over. Even with a mortar shell, you could hear them coming. And so you could almost detect when one was coming in. And uh, anyway, uh, we knew just it was just a matter of time. To, so he went to pray it. And he said uh, he was nervous and he opened the Bible. And he said, read this, read this. And it was the 91st Psalm. I can hardly remember that without getting emotional. Mm. It's the first real spiritual experience I had with God. Mm. I didn't have it. wasn't no earthquake. I mean, there wasn't a growth of light and nothing. But there was just something that happened inside of me that just went through on me. I could not describe it. Mm. Uh, that morning when we started leave <coughs> the church, uh, I had no idea what I was going to say what I said. I said, uh, Brother Gingrich, uh, I would like for you to, if you have time, sometime stop by the house. I'd like to talk to you. And he said, uh, what about? I said, I don't know. I guess, I, guess I, I guess I need to get saved. And he said, well, why don't we take over right now? Very wise man. Anyway, I said, well, I, I hesitated, you know, and I said, well, okay. He said, he reached and took hold of my hand. He said, let's pray. And uh, I said, uh, I knew he was talking about pray out loud, you know, or I felt like he did. I said, I don't know how to pray. He said, well, would you repeat a prayer I pray? And I said, I, I guess so. And so he closed his eyes, bowed his head, and I did the same thing. He said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I didn't say anything. <laughs> and he, he repeated, he said, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I guess I was thinking about it, you know. So I opened my eyes, and he was looking right at me. He said, Lord, I'm a sinner. And brother, I said, Lord, looking right in this preacher's eyes, he said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Mm. He said, forgive my soul. Mm. I said, forgive my soul. He said, come into my heart right now. Mm. <laughs> he did it. In that moment, yeah. He did that's it. Good. That's I know good. that's when it happened. That's good. I know it. Yes, yes. Well, Mr. Young, thank you for your time. I'm so grateful that God saw fit uh, to well, cross our you. path a couple weeks ago. And just Praise honor Lord. for you. Thank you for your services. Thank you for your service for our country. And thank you for, for your services for the kingdom of God. Just grateful for you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I've been going to church. Yes. And I will be going to church when church get open again. We have to come see us. How about that? I certainly Be will. my guest, right? It would be an honor to. We'd love, love to have you. Love to have you. Well, God bless yeah. you. Wow. What an incredible man. Can I just say I love Mr. Young. I'm so grateful that God saw fit to cross our paths just a few weeks ago. He is truly a hero of the faith and truly a hero of this great country. Hey, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's go ahead and meet in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we'll be today. And I know what you're thinking. You thought we were in 1 Thessalonians studying exegetically through that book, but we have called a timeout uh, for this weekend, being Memorial Day, and thought we'd take a break and dive into 2 Timothy and celebrate Memorial Day. Now, Memorial Day officially is tomorrow, and I know that many people will see Memorial Day as just a three-day weekend, but for those 
of you who've lost someone uh, because of war or military action, please know that it's much, much more than just an extra day. We know that men and women died for this country so we can have the right to preach God's word. Many men and women have died for this country so we can uh, live at peace in our homes. Many men and women have died for this great country so we can pursue our hopes and dreams and happiness. So Memorial Day is a time that we remember a sobering fact, and it's this, that the cost of freedom is ultimately the great sacrifice. So I just want to say on behalf of Faith Arlington, if you have served in any branch of our U.S. military, please know uh, that we're grateful for you. And if you are here and you're tuning in and you have lost a loved one who has paid the ultimate sacrifice for this great country, from the bottom of our heart, we want to say thank you on behalf of Faith Baptist Arlington. Hey, as today, as we dive into the, the scripture of uh, 2 Timothy, we want to understand a few things. We're going to talk about the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul is standing at the end zone of his life. We know that Paul is looking back at the game he's played, really at the life he's lived, if you will. And however, for all intents and purposes, know this, that Paul's ministry is really officially over. Paul is sitting in a Roman prison as he pens these words, and he's really not looking forward to anything but his execution. Paul knows that his time has come. It's time for him uh, to pass from this life and, and go to the next life that he's looking forward to. He's going to talk about that in great detail in the text today. But we know that he's sitting in a Roman prison, and he's about to lose his life. And in the midst of that, Paul would, would write an interview, and he would write this letter to young Timothy. And I'm just telling you this morning, I'm glad he did, because we have the privilege and honor of leaning in just a little bit of some of Paul's last words. Now, I, I want to just talk about Paul for a moment. In this text today, it's almost as if Paul is writing his epitaph. Now, if you know what an epitaph is, it's when that moment comes when you'll breathe your last breath. And, and I know this is encouraging on Memorial Day, but, but we, we know that, that that time's coming. And we know that in that midst of that, that you'll breathe your last breath, you'll be put in a, in a tomb, and, and your loved ones will sketch a saying on your headstone. And, and it'll be people who love you dearly, and they will carve that, that saying out on that headstone of, of what it meant and what your life would look like. Now, I'm weird to this fact. I, I love history. You guys know that. And I absolutely love old cemeteries. And the time I spent in Ironton, Ohio, there was a cemetery there called the Woodlands. And it dates back to late 1700s, early 1800s. And I would just spend time there reading the, the epitaphs on, on headstones and man, just incredible, incredible memories there. And it would truly, truly tell the life in a short phrase that someone lived. And so it was an incredible time. And I'm just reminded of the story, speaking of epitaphs. So this man one time who was doing what I did, just kind of walking around the cemetery reading the epitaphs of headstones, and he saw one. And here's what it said. It said, Paul, stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. I am now, so you will be, so prepare for death and follow me. Now, he read those words, and he thought, man, I don't, I don't really know this guy at all. So he, he grabbed out a pencil, and he wrote on the headstone, replied to the epitaph, and here's what he wrote. He said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. And so it would be very, very important for this guy to have known the gentleman who passed away of the epitaph that he read. So today, we're looking at Paul. We're going to look at his story. We're going to look at uh, his life at the very end. And I believe today if Paul was to write an epitaph, it would be really verse 7 of this text found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And here's what it says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. This great man, this great apostle, right before he died, would write these words to young Timothy. So we're going to dive right in today. But we're going to look today and we're talking about remembrance. We're talking about Memorial Day, remembering, and we're going to look at it through the lens of the Apostle Paul, but we're going to apply these truths to our life today. So let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, looking at verses 6 through 8. And here's what the Bible says. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the words that the Apostle Paul would leave Timothy. And God, we pray today that as we dive into this text, 
Father, we pray that your word would go forth in spirit and truth. Father, would you open our hearts today and we'd be challenged by the words that Paul would leave for us. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today as we look at this text, there's a question that begs to be answered. And here's the question. How do you want to be remembered? At the end of your 40, 60, 80 years on planet Earth, how would you want to be remembered by those who knew you the best? And we're going to look at Paul again and his death, and we're going to see what he would write. We know that Paul is approaching his own death, and he would draw to some conclusions about his own life, what would happen next. And so we're going to look at three areas that he wrote out very clearly in the text today. And I want to challenge us in these areas of remembering our own life. So if you're taking notes, number one, here's what I want you to see. Paul lived with the end in mind. Number one would be this. Paul lived with the end in mind. Verse 6 says this, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. Now, when Paul says that he's being poured out like a drink offering, this is referring to an Old Testament ritual. When you go in for a sacrifice, many times you would bring a drink offering. Sometimes that drink offering would be uh, given to the priest and then sometimes it would be uh, given as, as a offering. And then other times a drink offering, a true drink offering for a worshiper, though, would be given strictly for the fire to be consumed. Now, the priest at that time would drink any of that drink offering. You would come in as a sacrificial drink offering and you would pour it on the burning fire. And in that moment, the, the wine, would, the drink offering, would quickly evaporate, bringing a sweet smelling aroma uh, to the nose. So it's symbolic of this going, listen... I'm gladly giving all I am to the Lord. It is, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. He's saying, listen, my yes is on the table. It don't matter what happens. I, I'm giving my all to the Lord. And that's, there's nothing I'm holding back, no regrets. And this is what Paul would say. I'm, I'm, I've poured myself out. I've poured my life out like a drink offering. So he's saying it's all on the table. Now, this was, was not Paul's go around, first go around with death. We, we know that he's at the end of the life of his life when he's penning these words. But we know this in the first time. He says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says that his life is a living sacrifice acceptable to God. We know that in that moment that he's saying that he's being poured out like a, a drink offering. He knows that he will not be crucified according to Roman law. A Roman could not be crucified. So Paul knew more than likely, now get this, he's in a, a, a Roman prison cell penning these words, knowing that more than likely his death would have been beheaded. He would be beheaded. He knew that time was coming, and he knew that it was coming pretty soon. But this, again, this wasn't his first run-in with death. We know according to 2 Corinthians, we kind of give Paul's battle scars, and it's a tough one, if you will. And here's what we know. He says this, that Paul's been beaten many times without number. We know that that text tells us 39 lashes that Paul would take from the Jews with a rod. We also know that Paul would be stoned. And he would survive the stoning. And we know also that Paul three times would be shipwrecked and, and survive that. Many sleepless nights, many, many nights of hunger and thirst. And so he knew that the end was near. He knew that his death was close at hand. And this was Paul. He said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And then he would use the word departure. My departure is near. Now I want to kind of break that word down for us just a little bit to understand the text. We understand the word departure means three meanings. It means this, it's like a ship that's hoisting the anchor about to raise the sails and set sail. My departure, the, the ship is leaving. And Paul's going, I'm about to leave. I, I've, I've lived my life on planet Earth. I know my time is coming. My departure, my, I'm raising the anchor. I'm raising the sails and I'm about to leave uh, planet Earth. And it also refers to an army who's made camp. They hear the soldiers coming. They would pack camp and they would leave. And that's kind of the, a picture there of his departure. And then lastly, it almost means, it also means that you're carrying a staggering burden. And so Paul's carrying all these burdens and he's saying, laying his burdens down. He's going, listen, I lived a life, a tough life, a life that, that we see a, a lot of it would almost have cost him his life on many, many occasions. And he's saying, it's, all that's happening and I'm being poured out like a drink offering. He says, my time has come to be with the Lord. And I would say this, if you're writing your Bibles, I, I wrote this by, that, by verse 6. I wrote, no regrets. Paul had absolutely no regrets. Was he concerned about the end of his life? He may have had some concerns, but as he looked back, not a perfect life, but Paul knows from the day of Damascus, when he got saved, that he left it all for the Lord. No regrets. And I pray at the end of my life that it would be said about me that I had no regrets. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 says this. It says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul would say, hey, I know life's about over. I know I've left it all on the field, no regrets. Let's look at number two. Not only did Paul live with the end in mind, I want you to notice Paul's epitaph. We've talked about that already. Verse seven, Paul would say this. This is his verse. He would say that I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. So what kind of uh, life did Paul live? I want to give you three areas of Paul's life that I want us to look at. Number one would be this. Paul would live a disciplined life. He fought the good fight. To fight a fight, you have to be disciplined. You have to train well. You have to eat well. You have to condition well. And Paul would tell you, he would use that terminology, I fought the good fight. This speaks of the struggles that he would have. He would have troubles. He would have distress. He would have tribulations. He would have hardships. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, here's what it says. Paul's describing for us the Christian life. And he would say these words, and it looks much different than our Western Christian culture. Listen to what he would say about the Christian life. He says, But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions and hardships and calamities and beatings and imprisonments and riots and labors and sleepless nights and in hungers. He's saying, I have faith, spiritual opposition, but we understand that Paul would live a very disciplined life. Not only a disciplined life, but we understand that Paul would live a very directional life. He says, I finished the race. He fought the fight. We understand that that would be very disciplined. And then he says, I finished the race. That would be very directional. Can I just tell you this? When you're running a race, you know what direction you're running. And Paul would knew that very plainly, very clearly out of this text. He's not saying that, hey, I have, I have fought the good fight, I finished the race. Not doing, hey, I, I finished the race, I did what I want to do. No, he did exactly what God had called him to do. He knows in good times or bad, whether it was tough or hard, he was obedient to what God had called him to be. Can I just say today, ask you the question, are you being obedient to what God has called you to do and to be? A very disciplined, a very directional life. And then lastly, we understand that Paul lived a very doctrinal life. He says, I kept the faith. Can I just tell you today, there's many obstacles out there for us, for you and for I, to live a different life. There, there are many things out there that can make us waver in our faith. He says, I kept the faith, all the beatings, the stonings, every, the shipwrecks, everything. He never lost faith. When it could have been easy, he never lost faith. It's been said, the man who wants to lead the orchestra must turn his back on the crowd. What a great saying. Paul would be leading the orchestra, turning his back on what's popular, but following what God had called him to do and to be. So we see Paul's epitaph. Let me give you number three. The last one would be this. In the end, we know this. Paul received his reward. Paul received his reward. Listen to this in verse 8. Verse 8 says this. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Do you know who he's speaking of there? He's speaking to me and to you, ones who have called upon the name of the Lord, who, who trusted the completed work of the cross. Paul's going, I have a reward coming, but not only for me, but for you guys as well. And that gives me great hope this morning. That's why he knows that he's about to receive his reward. I, I wrote in my Bible, and I hope you write in yours, I wrote this at the very end of that text. I wrote this, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I heard a story a while back about this lady who had terminal cancer. And she was passing away, and she met, wanted to meet with the pastor, and she did. And he, she told the pastor, listen, I know that God's about to call me home, and here are the, here are the, the songs I want at the funeral, and here's the, the text I want preached at my funeral. He says, is there anything else that you would like at your funeral? And she said, yes, sir. Would you please put a fork in my right hand? And he kind of looked perplexed, and he leaned down and said, I'm not really understanding. I understand everything you've asked me to do, and I'll do it. But what, what do you mean about the fork? And she said, well, every time... Growing up in church, when we would have the potlucks, and they had to be a Baptist story, they're having potlucks at church, right? She said, every time we'd eat, I'd eat the meal, and the waiter would always come by, and he'd lean down, and he'd say, hey, you may want to keep your fork. Dessert's coming. You may want to keep your fork. The best is yet to come. And she said, listen, I want people, when I'm laying in that casket, to ask, what's the fork for? And in that moment, Pastor, I want you to tell them, she said, the best is yet to come. So when Paul is writing these words, and he says, on that day, not only me, but all who believe will receive their reward. He's saying, listen, the best is yet to come. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 says this, says this, Blessed are you when others 
revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, be glad, your reward, there's that word again, your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And we see this very, very incredible, incredible encouraging word for Paul. Going, hey, there's coming a day. You live this life on planet earth. And that's what Paul is saying. Listen, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. All this for the day that's coming. He lived with the end in mind. He knew this reward's coming. Can I tell you, church, listen, we forget about the reward coming. There's going to be a day to where you and I will stand before Jesus face to face. And we'll receive rewards for all of what we've done. And listen, in that moment, not for us, and it's not a works-based, um, a, a works-based religion, but it's from the fruit of our work. We get to lay that crown at the feet of Jesus. It's going to be an incredible, incredible day on that day. He, he talks about that. Listen, in closing, I, I just want to, I want to read this to you. I, I saw this the other day, and I thought it was interesting. In Howard Hendricks of Dallas Theological Seminary, he did an exhaustive study on men and women of the Bible. And, and here's what they found. They, they said that approximately, there's approximately 100 great detailed biographies of great men and women in the Bible. 100 autobiographies of great men and women of faith in the Bible. And there's what, here's what they said. Two-thirds of these men and women, it ended poorly. And here's what it said. Either they turned to immorality or they drifted away from their faith. Or they ended the life of, in a backslidden condition. Two-thirds of those people that we find of heroes of the faith, it did not end well. But can I tell you who was not in that list? The Apostle Paul. Can I tell you who else said, I don't want to be in that list? Brian Carlisle. What about you? I want to finish well. Hey, I read this story. Maybe you've heard it. The year was 1945, and his name was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham came storming out of seemingly what seemed to be nowhere to fill auditoriums across America, speaking to 30,000 people a night. Dr. Billy Graham was hired as the first full-time evangelist for the Youth for Christ, and he had a reputation of being a uniquely gifted communicator, preacher, and he roaring like a, a prairie lion across America back in 1945, and of course the rest is history. You've heard of Billy Graham, but I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you heard the name Chuck Templeton or Bron Clifford? If you've heard of Billy Graham, how come you hadn't heard of these guys? Because let me give you a little story about them. Billy Graham wasn't the only young preacher packing auditoriums in 1945. Chuck Templeton and Brian Clifford were accomplished the same thing and more. All three of these young men were in their mid-20s. One of the seminary presidents, after hearing Chuck Templeton preach one evening to an audience of thousands, called him the most gifted and talented preacher in America today. Now that's from a seminary professor. So Templeton and Graham were friends and both ministered to Youth for Christ, both extraordinary preachers. Yet both of these guys in the early age, most observers would have probably put their money on, on Templeton and not Graham. So in 1946, the National Association of Evangelistic Group came out and said, listen, they did this great article on, on Templeton, but you know who wasn't in the article? Mr. Billy Graham. So Templeton was this man. He was head and shoulders of, of, above Billy Graham in the preaching circuit. And what about Brian Clifford? He was another gifted speaker. He was in his mid-20s, 25-year-old fireball, 1945. Many believe that Clifford was the most gifted and powerful preacher the church had seen in centuries. He was in Miami, Florida one day, and literally people lined up 10, 12 deep in line to see him. Literally thousands and thousands of people came to hear him preach. He was preaching one time at Baylor University, and the, and the, the president of Baylor University turned off the bell, so he'll be un, uninterrupted in his preaching. And it said in that moment that Brian Clifford would preach for two hours and 35 minutes, keeping every college student on the edge of their seat. And he preached from the subject, Christ and the Philosopher's Stone. At the age of 25, Clifford touched more lives and influenced more leaders and set more audience records than any other clergyman in American history. 1945, Graham, Templeton, and Clifford came shooting out of the starting box. You've heard of Billy Graham, so why hadn't you heard of Chuck Templeton or Brian Clifford? Here's why. Just five short years later, Templeton, Chuck Templeton, would leave the ministry, and he would pursue a career on radio and TV as a commentary and a newspaper columnist. Templeton had decided that he was no longer a believer in Christ in the orthodox sense. By 1950, the Babe Ruth wasn't even in the game anymore. He didn't believe the validity of the claims of Christ. How sad. 
What about Brian Clifford? By 1954, Brian Clifford had lost his family, his ministry, and his health, and then his life. Alcohol and financial irresponsibility had done him in. He wound up leaving his wife and their two Down syndrome children. How sad. At the age of 35 years old, the great Pete preacher died from cirrhosis of the liver in a rundown motel on the edge of Amarillo, Texas. His last job was selling used cars in the panhandle of Texas. He died, as John Hagee would put it, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. Some pastors of the Amarillo Association collected some money to purchase a casket and be shipped back east with his body for a decent burial in the cemetery for the poor. 1945, three men with extraordinary gifts preaching the gospel on multiple occasions to thousands across the nations. Within 10 years, only one of them was still on track for Christ. Here's the reality. Three incredible men, one finished well. Let me ask you a question. How will you finish? I, I believe the question is more important today when we think about our life. It's not how we started. It's not even where you are in the race. But I believe more importantly, the question for us today is how will you finish? Maybe you're listening today and you go, you know what? I, I'm not really sure what race I'm in. I, I'm kind of just running waywardly. I, I'm really, I really don't know. Let me ask you this today. If you've never caught upon the name of the Lord. Today would be a great day for you to do that. Just repent of your sin. Talk to Jesus in a prayer and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm asking you today to come into my life and save me. If you pray that prayer and you ask Jesus to come into your life and save you, forgive you your sin and you repent of that, the Bible says he'll do that. And then we know that you're in the race. You know which direction you're headed. But let me just ask you, sir, ma'am, who've done that. Will you finish well? I pray in my life that it will be said about me that he fought the good fight, he finished the race, and he finished well. What is it in your life today that's keeping you from finishing well? And I pray whatever that is, that you would ask God to remove that from your path. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor that we have today to preach your word. And Father, we know that one of the many reasons we get to stand behind this pulpit today and preach freely this inerrant and fallible word of God is because many men and women who've lost their lives for our freedom. And God, I just say today, thank you for those brave men and women. God, we pray for those today who are on the front lines fighting the battle. God, I pray for their families back here. God, I thank you for them. But God, we thank you first and most importantly for the freedom that we have in you through your son that you had sent over 2,000 years ago. So God, I pray today that as we reflect on our life and as we remember our life, God, I pray that we would finish well. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.